afternoon, everyone. Sorry to be sorry. Thank you. Sorry to be late. Uh, Are you really? I am sorry to be late. You, don't, you think I don't want to get on with my day as much as you do? Uh, <laughs> let me. All right. I'll accept your apology. No, thank you. Uh, let me start with some opening comments. As we mark two years this week since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the brutality of Putin's regime is increasingly evident both at home and abroad. The weakness and rot at the heart of the system that Putin has built was confirmed not only by Alexei Navalny's death last week, but also by the fact that, the Russian, uh, that Russia detained close to 400 people over the weekend just for mourning his passing. The Kremlin has poisoned Navalny, imprisoned him unjustly, kept him in harsh conditions, and denied him medical care. It is the Russian government that is responsible for Navalny's death while in detention. And now, in, a free, in any other society, in a free democratic society, we would see openness and transparency as his family seeks more information about their beloved son, husband, and father. But of course, in Russia, openness and transparency remain in short supply. We saw further evidence of Putin, the Putin regime's brutality and disregard for human life in Advika this weekend, where Ukrainian citizens bravely tried to hold off Putin's illegal invasion while facing rationed ammunition due to dwindling supplies. Unfortunately, Russia made its first notable gains in months. It is now clear, more clear than ever what the stakes are in Ukraine. Without more support from Congress, Ukraine will not be able to replenish its air defenses and ammunition supplies to, to help protect itself from Russia's aggression. As the White House announced this morning, at President Biden's direction, we will be announcing a major sanctions package on Friday to hold Russia accountable for Navalny's death in prison and for its actions over the course of the vicious and brutal war they have waged in Ukraine for the past two years. We also renew our call for Congress to pass the National Security Supplemental Funding Bill, both to enable Ukraine and its people to defend against the ongoing invasion and also to advance U.S. national security interests. It is critical that Congress act without further delay. With that, Matt. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> before we get into the, um, uh, what you just talked about, I just want to um, get uh, what you have to say about the, the detention of a uh, U.S.-Russian dual national. So um, with respect to this most recent detention, we are aware of the case. Uh, we are seeking consular assistance uh, that has not yet uh, been granted. We're uh, at limit what more we can say uh, because, we, uh, with respect, because of privacy laws, as I've discussed many times from this podium. Uh, and I will just say generally, as um, I think you are aware, Russia, when it comes to dual citizens of the United States and Russia or dual citizens of any other country in Russia, Russia does not recognize dual citizenship, uh, considers them to be Russian citizens first and foremost. And so oftentimes we have a difficult uh, time getting consular assistance, but we will pursue it uh, in all matters where a U.S. citizen is detained. Okay. Uh, and then on the sanctions, uh, why wait until Friday? Uh, it takes time to put these sanctions packages together. Um, there are, uh, uh, well, it's there's been two a, there's years. A, I mean, the, you, it's, it has been, it's been two years. The anniversary was coming up. And if you have watched, you have seen us roll out a significant number of sanctions packages over that two years. So it's yes. not like we have delayed anything. No, no, no. I but all, we are always looking to impose new sanctions as facts uh, justify when we see sanctions evasion or sanction or activity moving to new areas and to tighten our, pre, our, our existing sanctions. And we'll have more to say on Friday. Uh, okay. Uh, Go ahead, Sean. Where do you want to go? Uh, could, could I um, ask, also ask you just if any reaction on uh, Evan Gershevich, his the latest uh, pretrial detention that he's he's been kept in for another thirty months? So, excuse me, thirty days. So, um, with respect to Evan Gershevich, uh, Ambassador Tracy attended Evan's hearing and spoke to the press soon after. You may have seen her comments. Uh, we're disappointed, but not surprised by the outcome of the hearing. I was, you've heard me say many times from this podium, the charges against him are baseless. Russia should immediately release Evan Gershkovich and Paul Whelan, and the United States will continue to work towards securing both of their freedom. And just one other on the Russia, um, uh, Radio Free Europe. Do you know if you saw the, the Russian announcement in that saying it's undesirable as an organization? Um, do you have any reaction on, on, on the Russian statement? I don't have any specific reaction other than to say that you have seen Vladimir Putin uh, uh, oppose the free dissemination of information, uh, the, the free press uh, inside Russia, and unfortunately that seems to be, uh, uh, seems to, uh, not surprisingly, but unfortunately not moved off that position. 
Let me go to Humera first. Um, Matt, can you say at all if the administration is going to use this EO that uh, that you guys issued in December that threatened basically penalties for financial institutions <coughs> that help circumvent Russia's sanctions? Uh, you mean with respect to our announcements that are coming on Friday? I certainly don't want to preview yes, those. And I just I just say in general, in, the announcements in, that are coming on Friday, on, on that Friday you that you would like me public on Monday, that you would like me, it's Tuesday actually. Um, oh, Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> but um, oh, okay. we made public that we'll be taking that action. I don't want to preview what they will be, but uh, as we have said, they will be a major sanctions package. Right. Can I can I just ask a little bit on Ukraine um, coming off the heels of um, Munich Security Conference, <clears throat> where a lot of European leaders and sort of various officials have tweeted um, their rather negative outlook about you know the supplemental in Congress and all that. And uh, Congress is on holiday until mid March. What exactly is the administration planning? Um, how to convince the speaker? whether you have a plan B if the supplementals prospects look um, pretty bleak. So we will continue to engage with Congress to make clear that it is in the national security interests of the United States to pass this supplemental uh, funding request. You heard the Secretary speak about this last week. One of the points he made is that uh, when it comes to our security assistance to Ukraine, 90 percent of that money is actually spent here in the United States. It benefits American manufacturing. It benefits American technological development. Uh, so we will continue to make that case. But I think it's also the American people that make that case. If you look at the recent polls that came out, the American people overwhelmingly continue to support standing with Ukraine. And there were a number of members of Congress who were in Munich over the, uh, over the weekend and uh, at the end of the last week attending the Munich, Munich Security Conference, and they heard directly from Ukrainian officials and from uh, European officials how it is in the national security interests of Europe and also in our transatlantic national security interests. So we'll continue to make the case, but I would say it's not just the United States that will continue to make the case. And I will say, as you have heard the Secretary say, there is no other magic plan that we can unveil to support Ukraine. Ukraine will continue to defend itself, even in the absence of a supplemental funding request passing Congress. That is without a doubt. You have seen them fight with bravery. You've seen them fight uh, with skill. And we fully expect that they will continue to do so. And they will continue to make gains uh, uh, against Russia, as they have done in the Black Sea. But the situation will be very difficult. When you don't have the ammunition you need uh, on the front lines, you're going to be vulnerable. And that's what we saw over the weekend with the loss of Advika and, uh, or Advika. And so I think it's the facts on the ground that will continue to make the case to members of Congress why they need to act, and we hope they will. We, would you say that you're, you still have some sort of confidence that it will pass? I don't want to make an assessment of what Congress will do. We, what we will uh, uh, say and continue to represent is why it is in the national interest of the United States for it to pass this bill. Members of Congress will have to make their own assessments. And it continues to be our belief that if you brought this funding up for an up or down vote, it will pass the House. And that's what needs to happen. OK, I have some Gaza <coughs> questions, but I'll let people yeah, ask. Go ahead. Max Nigel, uh, Russia. Uh, Russian Supreme Court of Tatarstan uh, today rejected uh, also Kurmashov RFR reporters. Uh, request uh, for house arrest. Let me get a quick reaction and uh, I want to follow up on that. Uh, so um, uh, we will continue to engage with the Russian government. This is another one, that, that, uh, another matter where they consider a uh, uh, this to be a dual, dual well, not a dual citizen. It's another matter of a dual citizen they, where they rejected uh, uh, that request. We'll continue to engage with the Russian government on this question, but I don't want to uh, speak to the specific court matter. I mean, yesterday marked four months of uh, uh, rest, well, day before yesterday. Are you telling us that you are out of uh, option here in terms of uh, defending the U.S. citizens? The though? safety and security of United States citizens overseas is always our first priority, and we always look to protect the, the safety and security of every United States citizen, whether they be in Russia or whether they be in any other country. Is her designation, uh, designation of her arrest as wrongful, is it still on the table? Are you still considering? I, I just don't want to, to make any kind of judgment about uh, a wrongful de uh, detention determination. That is something uh, that we always look at when it comes to American citizens who are detained overseas. It is a process. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes new facts develop that we take under consideration. But I don't want to put, uh, I don't want to, to speak to that uh, any further from here. I'm going back to Sean's question. Uh, so, you, so on this, uh, Alex, yeah. RFPRL to uh, yeah. Russia has labeled the uh, Radio Free Europe uh, today as an undesirable uh, organization after designating it as a foreign agent 
Do you have? I, I just I commented on that a moment ago. Just to say we have seen Russia continue to crack down on a free press, continue to track down to crack down on transparency. It is quite clear that they do not want their uh, people to have information about what the Russian regime does abroad, what the Russian regime does to its own people. And uh, and one more, uh, Russia places. I don't US think Senator, completely use the uh, you, you since, the floor. Since but, you're talking but, about, but, but go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, Russia places U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham uh, on uh, Russia's terrorist and extremist list. Any any reaction to that? So I uh, we've seen obviously the Russian government designate a broad range of uh, United States officials with various sanctions. Uh, I doubt there are any significant ramifications from that. I partly because I doubt very much that Senator Graham, who I shouldn't speak to, he can speak for himself. Uh, tr plan to travel to Russia any time in the near future. Okay. Uh, is it uh, fair for us to uh, report the fact that you just said you will not take any action just for RFA? Alex, you can report back what I just said, <laughs> not your implication of what I didn't said, say. And what I said was that the safety and security uh, of American citizens abroad is always our first priority. <laughs> that is true with respect to this case. It is true with respect to every American uh, overseas. And when it comes to the wrongful detention determination, that is a process that takes time here at the department where we assess the facts, some of which change over time, circumstances change over time, and make a determination that is consistent with the law. Give us come back to Andy, go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two, two questions on South Korea, Cuba, and North Korea. South Korea and Cuba established uh, diplomatic relations last week. <clears throat> uh, Cuba has been a brother country with North Korea for a long time. What is the U.S.'s? Uh, I don't. I don't have any any comment on relationship between South Korea and Cuba. Obviously, we have always uh, always said that countries are free to pick their own, uh, free to decide their own diplomatic engagements and their own diplomatic alignments. Okay. On North Korea, North Korea's Kim Yo Jong announced that uh, North Korea is open to talks with uh, Japan. If Japan does not interfere with uh, North Korea's nuclear and uh, missile test <coughs> and abduction issues. Uh, my question is, if Japan tolerates this and uh, talk with uh, North Korea, what impact do you think it will have on the U.S. and South Korea, North Korea alliance? Uh, I think that's a pretty big if. I think I will wait to see how the government of Japan uh, responds to that uh, question before I weigh in any further. Right. Do you, you don't have any. Uh, I, 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 I am a, uh, aware of the you know, North Korean aware. offer. I have not seen the government of Japan uh, respond, but it will be continue to be our policy to achieve to that that uh, uh, for full denuclearization of the North Korean or of the Korean Peninsula. That of course has not changed. Any intention of change. any intention of North Korea? Why they suggest to talk to me? The North. That is a good. That is a question for North Korea, not for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about a statement by the UN experts from the UN uh, Human Rights Office yesterday expressing al alarm over allegations of human rights violations to which Palestinian women and girls in the West Bank in Gaza is subjected to. They said, the UN experts said that Palestinian women and girls in detention have been subjected to multiple forms of sexual assault by male Israeli army officers. At least two of, two of them were reportedly threatened with rape and sexual violence. Have you seen those allegations? So Do you have any reaction? I have seen the allegations. I cannot independently confirm the reports. I will say that we have been clear that civilians and detained individuals must be treated humanely and in accordance with international humanitarian law. We strongly urge Israel to thoroughly and transparently investigate credible allegations and ensure uh, any accountability for abuses and violations, uh, and, and that will continue to be our, our position. Uh, have you heard back from uh, your previous call for investigation into the killing of uh, Hindra Jab? The Hindra Jab killing of we have um, uh, uh, we have heard that those investigations are underway. We have uh, it's our understanding the investigations have not yet been concluded. Sorry, can I just ask you? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, when you said you had no independent confirmation of what the UN experts found, I mean the underlying the yeah, underlying yeah, I get allegations. It, but, but, but did you ever get? Did you ever have confirmation of, of what Hamas allegedly did to Israelis who were women, girls who were? Uh, there are <coughs> uh, there are. Uh, Israeli medical experts who have testified to that, and that right. is something we can we consider credible. Yes. So, you have, you you consider those instances to be confirmed, but not 
what the UN We have seen this report is. and we have called for an investigation to confirm whether the allegations are true or not. I, I get it. And who, and, and if you're willing to take the word of Israeli, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, but, but if you're willing to take the word of Israeli medical experts on what happened to the people who were abducted on October 7th, whose word are you willing to take? Or if not the UN, who? who a, a full, independent, credible uh, uh, investigation. Would it, be, would it have to be an Israeli uh, medical expert? Uh, we are calling for that in a, no, it of course would not have to be an Israeli well, medical expert, a credible medical Pal expert, Palestine, a, Palestine. Credible, a credible, I don't want to, I don't want to prescribe who it would be, a credible medical, ex medical expert that can testify to it would be something we would look at, of course. It would not have we to would be would look at, but you, but you take, you, you I'm, take I'm not going to, because that's one where we have seen the outcome of the investigation able to opine on it. I'm not going to opine on a matter. Well, yeah, but you didn't do your own independent investigation. And, and what I think, it, you know, it's pretty much well accepted by, by everybody that there were instances of uh, rape and sexual assault on October 7th. And the, and the circumstances so, very much matter. And in this, in this, in, I, the, I in this, it is a well, that, it is I a well, accept, hold on. It is a well accepted fact. With respect to this, yeah, no, 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 just let me finish. But you're saying just, that, you, but but you're saying the, that you have what you consider to be independent confirmation that those let, um, attacks, uh, those assaults happen. It is and independent in confirmation. Case, it is a well accepted fact because the investigations produced credible evidence that not just the United States okay. accepted, but countries, no, no, let me finish, countries around the world accepted. With respect okay. to these new allegations, we want to see an investigation, and we will, of course, look at the investigation and make our judgments when that investigation is concluded. Okay, so it's just too early. Correct. Thank you. Can I stay in the middle? Yeah. Um, just uh, well, a couple of things, but um, uh, of course, the Secretary's on his way to Brasilia. Uh, I'm sure you saw the comments by Lula, by President Lula. Um, uh, in Ethiopia uh, this, this past weekend. Uh, Israel's quite upset with them, you know, liking what's happening there to, to the Holocaust. Uh, do you have any comment on, both on, both do you have any comment on what Lula said, and do you think the Secretary will raise this with him as well? So obviously we dis disagree with those comments. We have been quite clear um, uh, that we do not believe uh, that uh, genocide has occurred in Gaza. We want to see the conflict ended as soon as, po as practical. We want to see humanitarian assistance uh, increased in a sustained manner to innocent civilians in Gaza, um, but we do not agree with those comments. And does do you expect the secretary to raise this? To, will this affect relations? I'm going to follow my general rule and 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 never preview what the secretary plans to raise before he has a chance to do so directly with officials. But we engage with Brazil on a number of issues, and I don't expect that to change. And just could we stay on, on the Middle East? Uh, obviously, there was the veto this morning uh, at the Security Council. I know. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield spoke about this at length, but uh, in, in terms of U.S. engagement with the region, um, how do you think this affects it? I mean, do you think that you know, a number of, uh, of Arab states in particular have been calling for a ceasefire? Uh, how does this, uh, how does this uh, take U.S. diplomacy? So look, when it comes to an immediate ceasefire, uh, this has been a place where we've had a disagreement with a number of countries in the region for some time now. I don't think that's anything that's new. Um, but that has not stopped us from being able to engage constructively about how to bring this conflict to an end. And not just uh, an end, but a durable end. In a way that, that ensures that the violence that we saw on October 7th and the death and destruction uh, that has plagued uh, this region for so long is not continued and that we can find, finally find a durable peace agreement. And so uh, despite our differences of opinion about the, the, this UN resolution, we continue to engage with Arab countries about finding a way forward and, and working on some of the issues that we know we will have to deal with when it comes to establishing long-term peace and security in the region. Let me make sure Sean's done before I go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just on Gaza, um, the, the mention of temporary ceasefire, the word ceasefire in the UN resolution, um, is this change in wording comes after President Biden used this last week? Uh, temporarily, it obviously does. The president made that point last week, and now you've seen the, the draft resolution that we're working on. But this has been a matter that we have been pursuing for some time, trying to get a temporary ceasefire. Uh, in exchange for a release of hostages and something we think is critical to try to achieve and we'll continue to focus on. Right. Do you think the administration has obviously been under pressure domestically on this and internationally as well? Do you think that the change in president's wording, but the fact that now it's in draft resolution has anything to do with those pressures that it's facing domestically? No, I think it has to do with how we are responding to the situation on the ground and the situation in the region. We are trying to achieve a temporary ceasefire, or you can call it a pause, you can call it whichever name you prefer, 
to secure the release of hostages. We worked on achieving a humanitarian pause back last year. We're successful in doing it. It didn't go as long as we, as we wanted it to. We got some hostages out. We didn't get all of them out. We are back now trying to get a longer pause, a longer temporary ceasefire, and secure the release not just of some of the hostages, but all of the hostages. <clears throat> and I would say we have made quite clear that we want to see not just a temporary ceasefire, but ultimately an enduring into the hostilities, and one that ensures that uh, Palestinian civilians are protected, that we get humanitarian assistance to them, and that ultimately the attacks of October 7th cannot be repeated. And that's one of the reasons why you've seen us oppose the resolutions uh, at the UN, not just today, but in the past, because we think uh, just an unconditional ceasefire only benefits Hamas, uh, that it would, that, you know, Hamas is not going to abide by a full temporary ceasefire. They're going to continue to hold hostages. They're going to continue to launch attacks against Israel. They may not do it for a week or so, um, but they have not forsworn their aims to uh, destroy the state of Israel. And so we've opposed that policy, and we think it's not one that's effective. We think a negotiated agreement that would get a temporary pause, a temporary ceasefire, is ultimately not just the way to release the hostages and uh, it alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people, but to give us a pathway to a more enduring end to hostility. Right. And you'd like to achieve that pause before Ramadan starts? We would like to achieve that pause yesterday. Right. We would like to achieve it today or tomorrow. We right. want to achieve yeah. it as soon as possible. Sure. But how concerned are you that the, uh, the fighting will continue into Ramadan? Are you doing anything specific about that? I don't want to get ahead of the situation because we are right now in conversations and in negotiations to try to achieve a uh, humanitarian pause. We are still over two weeks away from Ramadan. We would like to get that humanitarian pause before Ramadan begins. We'd like to get it before the end of the week, as I said. We'd like to get it as soon as possible. So that's what we're going to continue to try to do. At the same time, we have made clear that Israel should not uh, launch a full military campaign uh, in Rafah unless it has a humanitarian plan that is both credible and realistic and one that they can execute. Have you seen any indications of that humanitarian plan, and what is the United States prepared to do if they go ahead anyway? One has not been presented to us yet. I've seen reports that one is, is being developed and will be presented to the government of Israel this week. I will let them speak, of course, to that. But one has not been presented to the United States, so I, of course, can't speak to it. Uh, and I wouldn't want to deal with any kind of hypothetical situation down the road. Uh, go, Shannon, go ahead. Uh, while in Munich, the Secretary raised Russia's pursuit of an anti-satellite uh, capability in meetings with its Chinese and Indian counterparts. Can you say if this is the first time the Secretary has raised such meetings with other countries and whether he hopes to achieve anything by raising the topic with China and India specifically? Uh, so uh, I will say that on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference, he did raise Russia's pursuit of an anti-satellite uh, technology with our allies and partners, but not just our allies and partners, with other countries as well, because uh, as the Secretary uh, made clear, he thinks it's an issue that should be of concern not just to the United States, but to other countries in the world. And I won't speak to the details of those diplomatic engagements, but uh, I would just say generally that when you have an issue like this that we think should be of broad concern not just to the United States, but other countries, we of course would fully expect that they uh, would use their diplomatic engagements to, uh, uh, as we have done, urge that the pursuit of such a technology be abandoned. Can you say if those other countries, did they express concern about the capability as well? I just don't want to speak to private diplomatic engagements. Uh, yeah, Thank you, sir. Uh, Pakistani official admits uh, to helping rig the vote. He claimed that he changed the election results with a margin of 70,000 votes in favor of Nawaz Sharif, and that uh, those seats were actually won by Imran Khan's uh, party's candidates. What are your views? You were already talked about the allegations of rigging and fraud. What are your views on this? So I saw that uh, that report. Uh, any claims of interference or fraud should be fully and transparently investigated. <clears throat> excuse me, in accordance with Pakistan's own laws and procedures, and that of course includes this claim as well. So a number of Pakistani politicians and media analysts uh, in Pakistan term these elections most controversial and asking political leadership to respect Imran Khan's party's mandate as the largest group. Would you also like to see the political leadership in Pakistan to respect the PTI's candidate? Again, uh, I don't want to get it. I'm sorry, I didn't sorry. cut you off. What was the last thing? So, uh, I mean, are you also like uh, asking the political leadership in Pakistan to respect the PTI's mandate? Uh, again, I don't want to get into uh, an internal Pakistani matter, which I very much believe that the formation of a new government is. 
Um, but uh, so that's a matter that I will leave to uh, Pakistan. But as I said, when it comes to the uh, any claims of interference or, alle or allegations of irregularities, we want to see those fully investigated. Can I just a different topic. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, there, there, Do you mind if I just follow very briefly? Yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, you guys are so nice to each other, like all the, <laughs> tolerating all these interruptions. Always, today. always cordial. Uh, huh? Uh, always trying to be. Uh, can I just follow on Pakistan though? Uh, in relation to this, he's gonna be mad if I don't come back to him now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I'll get to. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Uh, X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, uh, it's been disrupted in Pakistan in recent days. Um, there have been a number of calls from from the Hill in particular for the State Department to, to raise this. Has it been raised? Uh, do, do you have a stance on this? I don't have any updates on whether it's been something that's been raised, but we always want to see uh, uh, full internet, net, internet freedom around the world, and that includes uh, the availability of platforms that people use to communicate with each other. And specifically in Pakistan, is it of, of concern in light of these allegations about the election? So I would just say, as a general matter, that we want that to we want uh, internet internet platforms to. I don't know why I keep saying internet today, where that came from. Internet platforms to be available to uh, uh, people in Pakistan and around the world. Uh, and I don't have anything further than that. Nick, go ahead. Uh, thank you. There, there have been some reports over the weekend that the state inspector general opened an investigation <clears throat> into Rob Malley and is being put on leave. Um, do you have anything you can add to that? So I won't speak on behalf of the inspector general. As you know, they operate independently, and they should be the ones uh, to decide whether to confirm any investigation or not not confirm an investigation. I will say that uh, when it comes to inspector general investigations, we always uh, uh, comply with those fully, uh, and and will continue to do so. And then uh, separately, there's been some criticism of a cable that the secretary sent a few weeks ago on gender identity to <clears throat> staff, urging staff to use gender neutral language whenever possible and avoid terms like manpower and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, why do you think a memo like that was needed? So I will say, first of all, when it comes to these types of cables, they all come out with the secretary's signature on it. Um, that tends to be standard department practice, has been for uh, years. It doesn't mean that it's a, uh, uh, necessarily a memo from the secretary himself. I would say if you look at that memo, as I have done, uh, it's a standard government practice to try to encourage just people just to be respectful of others uh, and use the terms that, uh, with which others are comfortable and talk to people the way that they uh, would like to be addressed and nothing more than that. No. Actually, let me go back. Alex, I didn't, it's too late to come back, come to, back you. to you. You're right in front, so sometimes I come back, but there, there are people so, in the back so that need to. It's not an order. Uh, it is a, it is a uh, I, I would like to look at the memo again before, but my understanding of it is it was a best practice. Okay, piece. well, you remember there was a little bit of a kerfuffle uh, some time ago, maybe before you were here, when uh, you know, email. When people's pronouns were changed for them by yes. mistake, I do remember that. Exactly. No, yeah, no, this was uh, just encouraging people to be respectful and uh, treat people with treat people with respect and address them with the terms that uh, they feel comfortable with. Okay. Well, I mean, do, does the secretary or anyone else in the building have an issue with the phrase "ladies and gentlemen"? Uh, I do not have. Uh, not uh, you. I, I do. Hold on. I do not have any any problem with the term "ladies and gentlemen," and I feel fully confident saying the secretary does not either. Thank you, Matt. Bangladesh regime people involvement in corruption is an open secret. According to a <coughs> Bloomberg detailed report yesterday, Safiud Jaman Choudhury, one of the cabinet ministers, is alleged to have built an empire in the UK and USA valued at 200 million pounds sterling, equivalent to one percent of the country's foreign reserve. This is just one case among many. How is the U.S. addressing this matter to hold the government accountable and combat corruption globally? We are aware of these reports and encourage the government of Bangladesh to ensure that all elected officials comply with the country's laws and financial regulations. Matt, go ahead. Go, 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 go. No, no. The, the best way to not get called on is to shout out a question while I'm calling on other people. Go ahead. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will come across to this side of the room in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. In light of world pressure on Israel to accept a Palestinian state dividing their land with Hamas and Palestinian Authority terrorist organizations, and for Israel not to enter Rafah in Gaza to destroy Hamas there, what is the State Department's response to Prime Ministers Netanyahu and the Israeli cabinet, as well as the entire Jewish population, who are defending their right to live free from terrorism and a follow-up? We, of course, agree with Israel's right to live uh, free from terrorism. If you've looked at the uh repeated comments that Secretary Blinken has made, not just here in the United States, but in Israel uh, itself on his 
five trips to the region, he has made clear that he supports Israel's right to ensure that October 7th can never happen again. And more importantly, he is trying to achieve a resolution of this conflict that will ensure Israel has long-term peace and long-term security, including security, of course, from terrorism. Are you going to be uh, wanting to, to prevent Israel from entering Rafa to, to take out Hamas there? What we have said is we do not support an, uh, a full-scale military campaign in Rafa that does not account for the more than one million Palestinians who are currently there. People who have uh, nothing to do with Hamas, innocent civilians, uh, men, women, children, the elderly, who in many cases have fled to Rafa from their homes, in some cases have fled more than once, have fled two or three times. Uh, to escape the war, the conflict that is raging in Gaza. So we fully uh, support Israel's right to take a military campaign to Hamas and ensure that, uh, that the attacks of October 7th cannot be repeated, as I said. But we also want to see civilians properly accounted for. And right now, we don't believe that there is a way to conduct a military campaign in Rafah without uh, moving some of those civilians and properly accounting for their humanitarian needs. What are the reasons of the State Department for not demanding Hamas immediately release all remaining hostages unconditionally? I think you've missed uh, dozens and dozens of statements from the State Department going back to October 7th. Well, it's actually October 8th by the time that, uh, mm -hmm. that we were aware that uh, hostages should be released. And it was the first time the Secretary called for the immediate release of hostages. And he has continued to make that clear, as have I, as has the President. We have demanded time and time again that ho hostages be released immediately and unconditionally. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Matt. I just wanted to circle back to the verbiage used uh, in the draft, the UN draft today. I mean, how important is it that you use the word ceasefire as opposed to an extended pause, which is what you've been using prior? Uh, I will let other people make those sorts of assessments. From a policy perspective, we want to achieve a, a temporary stop in fighting. You can call that a ceasefire. You can call that a pause. Ultimately, we want to see the fighting stop so, civili so uh, hostages can get out, hostages can be released and humanitarian assistance can get in. But I should make clear, the only kind of temporary ceasefire that is going to achieve a release of hostages is one that's negotiated. Just calling for a temporary ceasefire is not going to, that Hamas has not agreed to is not going to do anything to get the hostages out, which is why we can continue to pursue diplomacy with Israel and with the governments of Egypt and uh, Qatar to try to achieve a temporary ceasefire that would secure the release of hostages. We think that is by far the most productive way forward. It is what pers what, what uh, achieved a release of more than 100 hostages last year, and what we think should be the productive uh, path for moving forward now. Two questions about Afghanistan. Yeah. As you know, the Taliban refused to, uh, to attend the uh, UN-sponsored uh, conference on Doha that uh, concluded yesterday. They didn't send any delegation, and also they rejected the appointment of a special envoy by UN in Afghanistan. Uh, does the United States still hope to engage with Taliban by considering all of this? Let me just tell, speak to what we were trying to engage, or what we were trying to achieve uh, by attending this conference. And uh, it's not surprising that the Taliban, ban, of course, has different uh, objectives. Uh, we were trying to achieve uh, a number of things. One. Uh, to make clear that Afghanistan should not be a hotbed for terrorist activities that impact other countries. Two, uh, a vision for Afghanistan with inclusive institutions in which its diverse groups all feel represented in a state that is truly inclusive. Uh, and number three, a concern about the respect uh, of human rights, and in particular, the rights of women and girls. So that's what we're going to continue to pursue. Um, uh, I shouldn't say, I can't say I'm incredibly surprised that t the Taliban declined the uh, invitation to participate in a meeting with a broad representation from uh, the international community. But I will say, as you've heard us say before, that the Taliban are not the only Afghans who have a stake in the future of Afghanistan. We will continue to support giving all Afghanistans, including, of course, women and girls, a voice in shaping their country's future. And uh, the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian invited to this meeting, they refused to meet with the Afghan civil society because they were not treated by the Taliban regime. Do you support this idea? And what's your take on that? So I won't, I won't speak to the actions of another country, but I will make clear uh, we always find engagement with civil society to be productive. Uh, we try to take actions through our diplomacy to empower civil society. And we would certainly encourage every country in the world to pursue that path. Let me, let, me, let me go back to, I promised you I'd come to you a minute ago. Go ahead. 
Me? Yeah. Well, now I call oh, on you. You don't want a question <laughs> after like jumping in for other people <laughs> during other people's Thanks, questions? I'll be very impactful. Uh, I, before I <laughs> ask you a question, I have to let you know that uh, Assistant Secretary of State Donald Liu was speaking at the Institute of uh, Peace in Washington, D.C. last week. He said that the situation in Burma was not getting better. And what worried him was that the refugee crisis and security problem it was creating for Bangladesh and potentially for India could get deeper in coming days. Uh, quote, it is something we have to watch out for and enable our partners in the region, in this case, Bangladesh and India, to cope with those stresses without it boiling over the instability in their countries as well over, I mean, cross-border instability. What is your opinion on that? Thank you. Uh, I think it was a uh, well-crafted, well-delivered speech, and I don't have anything to add to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Go ahead. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, the Houthis have escalated their attacks uh, on ships uh, in the Red Sea during the weekend. One of the attacks uh, targeted or damaged a ship and forced its crew to abandon it. Um, how do you view this escalation and what the, or how the U.S. will react? Um, so obviously we continue to condemn the reported uh, reckless and indiscriminate attacks on civilian cargo ships uh, by the Houthis, not just those that uh, were reported to have occurred over the weekend, but all those that have been occurring for the past number of weeks. But I just want to uh, mention something specific about uh, one of these attacks this weekend, uh, the attack on the sea, ch uh, the sea Champion. That ship was bringing corn and other food supplies to the Yemeni people in Aden. These were supplies for the Yemeni people. It had nothing to do with Israel, have nothing to do with the conflict in Gaza. That, of course, is what the Houthis have claimed their um, uh, attacks on civilian ships are trying to impact. This was a reckless attack on a ship delivering humanitarian assistance to the Yemeni people. And I think it was another sign that the Houthis continue to demonstrate disregard, not just for international shipping, not just for supplies that are going to benefit civilians all around the world, in many cases far from uh, the region, but ultimately for their own people. It was a dangerous attack, and the fact that they're uh, launching these just kind of wanton, indiscriminate attacks, even when they um, uh, hurt their own people and hurt the provision of supplies to their own people shows just how reckless their actions have been. And uh, on Lebanon, how do you view the escalation of military operations between Israel and Hezbollah? Will the U.S. participate uh, uh, in two conferences that will be held in France and Rome to uh, help increase the Lebanese army capabilities to implement the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1701? So we continue to be concerned about the risk of escalation and continue to be concerned about the risk of the conflict widening. Uh, and we continue to work to achieve a diplomatic path forward that resolves the legitimate concerns uh, of the government of Israel and the legitimate concerns of Israeli people who don't want to move back to the, the north because they feel that their houses continue to be threatened, their communities continue to be threatened by attacks from Hezbollah. So we're continuing to pursue that diplomatic resolution as it pertains to these two conferences, or I think maybe in one of the cases, potential conferences. Uh, I don't have anything to add about US, uh, possible US participation. Let me go back here. Thank yeah. you so much. I have two questions. One for the irregularities in Pakistan election. From the last Monday briefing, you have mentioned that the United States raised uh, privately and publicly the irregularities matter with Pakistani officials, but Ministry of Foreign Affairs Islamabad just in last briefing said they are not aware of any bilateral messaging that has taken place post elections. Meanwhile, what we observed that the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan just after two days of election held a meeting with former foreign minister of Pakistan. So two United States directed its mission in Pakistan to have engagements with the officials or the politicians. Secondly, I want to ask regarding the efforts for, for United States for the Israel Saudi normalization. Let me, let me, before we get in, let me ask, let me answer the, the question you asked, um, uh, which is I'm not going to talk to private diplomatic en engagements, but we have made clear that we want to see uh, any claims of ir any, irregular any irregularities or claimed irregularities for uh, fully investigated. Go ahead. So uh, the one. October 7th is considered as big damage for diplomatic efforts by U.S. in Saudi-Israeli normalization process. So uh, MBS, the Crown Prince, demanded two-state solution and he also looking for a timeline from U.S. So Netanyahu is not like bothering this two-state solution, this condition. So 
what is the time frame after the post gaza war what will be the damage repair by the us to repair this as number of arab nations have reservations on this oh. <clears throat> i don't want to speak to any timetable but i will say as again you have heard the secretary say we continue to work on the establishment of an independent palestinian state which we believe doesn't just benefit the palestinian people but would benefit the israeli people and would benefit the entire region that is something we have heard uh, from a number of Arab partners in the region, including, of course, uh, the government of Saudi Arabia. And one of the things that the secretary discussed directly with the crown prince and heard directly from the crown prince was that the uh, Saudi Arabia was not prepared to pursue normalization or was not prepared to agree to no normalization, I should say, without the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. Go ahead. Uh, can I just raise the uh, extradition hearing of Julian Assange, which has taken place at the High Court in London today, and his lawyers have repeated an allegation saying that there is evidence of that a plan was discussed to either kill or kidnap Assange while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in um, London. Mark Summers KC, uh, Assange's lawyer, saying senior CIA officials requested plans. The president himself, that's President Trump, uh, requested on being provided with options on how to do it and sketches were drawn up. Is there any comment? Uh, no, I um, uh, am not going to comment on an ongoing uh, lit extradition matter. Can I just ask a follow-up? Go, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Well, and I, I mean, I, I want to go back to what we were talking about a bit earlier, and that is just the question is whether the administration regards Julian Assange as a, as a journalist. So with respect to that question, I think I should – uh, decline to comment in detail because, as I said, it is an ongoing extradition matter and it's an ongoing legal matter. This is a case uh, which is under indictment. But I will just say generally that I have never heard a journalist say that it is a legitimate journalistic practice to help a source hack into a government computer to steal information. It's not a legitimate journalistic activity to hack into anything to steal government information. So I think I'll leave it at that. Well, OK. Well, that suggests that, 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 that you don't. And, I'm, I, and I want to specifically avoid getting into what the Justice Department has to say about this case. I, I want to talk about what the State Department believes about his status, Assange's status. Uh, because you guys are self-proclaimed champions of independent free press. You are all the time saying journalism is not a crime and this kind of thing. So if you believe that what Julian Assange has been doing or was do or did is uh, journalism, I don't see how you can, I don't see how that squares. With, so, and if you don't, are you, are you saying from your comment just now <coughs> that you don't regard him as a journalist because he accepted or allowed or the, helped someone so, hack, into, hack into computers? Is that So it? again, I'm at a limit to what I can say about an ongoing legal matter that is under indictment. I remember from my days as the Department of Justice spokesperson yeah, that it was well, exactly, let me, let me just, which let I think me, has let probably me, colored your let me, personal no, um, let me let me just let me just finish this answer that it's not appropriate for government that. officials to speak at length about matters that remain under in indictment. We support an independent free press in the United States. We support an independent free press around the world. Uh, we feel that an independent free press not just benefits the people of the United States, it benefits those of us in government by making us work harder, by making us be ready to explain what, what we're doing, by making us think through the decisions that we are making and make sure that they fully represent the best interests of the American people. And we think that same process holds true everywhere in the world, and that's why you see dictators and autocrats and others crack down on an independent free press. At the same time, Helping someone hack into, which is a crime, hacking is a crime, right? Helping someone hack into a government uh, network or a private network for that regard is not something I think any journalist considers to be a legitimate journalism activity. Okay, well, you, do you not think then that what was published as a result of the hacks into the government uh, database, especially as it relates to State Department cables, which are you know, many, many thousands of them, 
um, and, and, and th that were then published by an independent free press, uh, you, you don't you don't see a problem here with I the, think with 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 the prosecution or attempted prosecution, the indictment, and and your stated view that you think that this kind of activity should be protected. Again, if you look at the conduct that is alleged in the indictment, when it comes to uh, helping someone hack into a government network, that is a very different type of activity. So, pu so but, but publishing it is not. I, I am not going to get into the ongoing details of what is a, probably gone too far already in, t in discussing, this, discussing this case, uh, the ongoing detail, uh, the, the details of what is a very much a live ongoing lit what, litigation what, what, matter. Do you, not, do you not think the publication of, the, of, the, of these documents when they, when they came out, back the, the, the original ones, the ones that um, um, Chelsea Manning provided to, to WikiLeaks and when they were published by the New York Times and El Pais and all the and others, do you not think that that helped inform public discussion? Do you so not think that those I, that, that was useful? Let, let me say this because I'm not going to speak to that specific case for the reasons I just articulated, but I will say that two things can often be true when it comes to the publication of classified uh, uh, government documents. It is true that at times the, the publication of a classified government document well, will inform the public, and sometimes it will uncover wrongdoing. It's also true that sometimes the publication of classified government documents serves no underlying purpose, purpose and can jeopardize sources and methods that the government uses to keep the American public safe. So it is a very difficult situation. It's a, it is a, um, uh, I think, one of the trickiest uh, questions the government faces in, in navigating this area. Um, but I can tell you that we try to do it as responsibly as we can. All right, uh, over here, and then, yeah. And thank you so much for taking. Uh, I have two questions, if uh, you will allow. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the anniversary of the war in Ukraine that is coming up. Uh, and as you rightly know, at the very start of the war, um, uh, African countries, there was a sort of an outright split, right? Some ambivalence <coughs> of support uh, to Ukraine. So I'd I'm seeking your assessment on U.S. efforts, I'm not saying, you know, that you, you know, that we've had this conversation, the narrative about, you know, is or is the U.S. not trying to ask African <coughs> countries to pick a side? Um, that's not what my question is. My question is to ask, while we recognize that garnering international support for Ukraine's sovereignty and uh, territorial in integrity is important, what, over the two years, has been your efforts in the U.S in garnering international support in terms of African countries. And my second question is on Guinea. Let me, let me take that one first. So I will say that we have uh, engaged in countries all over the world, not just in Africa, but of course across the world, to urge them to support uh, Ukraine and support um, its efforts uh, uh, to defend itself from Russian aggression. We think when you see uh, any country's sovereign uh, borders violated, see its uh, control of its territory violated, that it threatens all countries around the world, because it is ultimately the uh, the UN Charter that upholds the, the territorial integrity and sovereignty of every country in the world. And I will just say, we uh, uh, not just because of our efforts, although they have helped, but because I think we've seen countries in the world uh, outraged by uh, Russia's activities, we have seen a number of UN resolutions, including ones that were joined by dozens of African countries, in support of holding those of upholding those principles, the UN Charter of Ukraine's uh, integral integral. In, sorry, territorial integrity, uh, and ultimately finding a comprehensive, just, and durable peace that recognizes those principles. Sure. And then on Guinea, if I may, and this will be my last question to you, Matt. Um, since yesterday, as you may already know, uh, there is no leadership in Guinea. I think uh, there is currently maybe some low-level leadership. They dissolved uh, the government, and so while I appreciate that you will not comment on the internal affairs of another country. Uh, I am asking you to see if you can comment on your own efforts and how you might be engaging any stakeholders in Guinea or in that part of the world uh, for that matter, or any regional organization yeah. besides ECOWAS, which may seem a little weakened. Are there any other countries uh, that you may be uh, engaging, Angola, uh, South Africa, Kenya, 
in your sure. efforts uh, in this regard? So we are closely monitoring developments in Guinea. We encourage the transition authorities to work with ECOWAS. It's something we've discussed uh, with a number of ECOWAS states um, uh, and uh, to continue positive momentum by holding a constitutional referendum and elections in order to complete uh, democratic governance. We remain concerned about media restrictions placed on the Ghanaian people. Uh, and calls on the trans uh, on the tra and call on the transition authorities to ensure that freedoms of peaceful assembly and expression are fully respected, including uh, for members of the press. And we are engaging with another number of countries in the region around those goals. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, one more. And then Kumara, did you have one? Sorry, that uh, but just just one more. Africa, uh, Rwanda DRC uh, issued a statement on Saturday, I believe it was, um, on the uh, so the DRC is alleging Rwandan involvement in the drone attack in, in, uh, on the airport. Um, the, I mean, since the statement, has there been any any uh, response from Rwanda? Are you confident that uh, that there's some progress in there? How do you see things going on? Uh, I don't have any update on the situation since uh, we released that statement over the weekend. But is it? Do you, do you find the DRC uh, allegations credible of Rwandan involvement? Uh, uh, I don't have anything to add in, 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 beyond what we said over the weekend. Humair, and then we'll finish up. Um, Matt, there were some incidents of the coast of Taiwan uh, in the past couple of days. China's Coast Guard boarded a Taiwanese tourist <coughs> boat, and on Tuesday, Taiwan drove away a Chinese Coast Guard boat that entered its waters. Are you guys worried about like any escalation tensions? Have you seen that? Yeah, we are closely monitoring Beijing's actions. We continue to urge restraint and no unilateral change to the status quo, which has preserved peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and throughout the region for decades. Uh, we urge the PRC to engage in meaningful dialogue with Taiwan to reduce the risk of miscalculation. And we share with other countries, not just in the region, but around the world, an abiding interest in peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and in the broader Indo-Pacific region, which impact global security and prosperity. And with that, we'll wrap for today. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.